Beauty and Sadness by Yasunari Kawabata. I've got to make the video very quickly today because in a couple of days I'm going to be going to Ontario to visit my family. <laughs> What's left of them? I thought, okay, I'll, I'll read the first 20 pages, get a taste. Because I, I've read Kawabata in the past. I read The Sound of the Mountain. I thought it was good, but I don't remember it well enough to describe it better than that. So 20 pages. And then I thought, well, maybe I can read 50 pages. It's really a very, very easy book to read. I got to 50 pages and I thought, well, you know, it's, it's 150 pages. Why don't I just read to page 75? And then I've read half the book. And when I got to page 100, I thought, well, I guess I'm going to read the whole goddamn book in one day. And I loved it. I could not stop reading this book. Very compelling, a little bit strange, but there's something about this Japanese literature where this state of tranquility just descends, even though it is, this is not a peaceful book to read. Right. So what is this book about? Beauty and Sadness. Well, this 50 something year old man named Oki is traveling from Tokyo to Kyoto. At first he tells us that he's going there to, to hear the New Year's Eve bells. Apparently in Kyoto they are ringing these bells on New Year's Eve. But really he wants to to meet with a woman that he had an affair with 20 years ago when he was 30 and when she was just 15. This woman that he's going to meet that he had an affair with, her name is Otoko. She's become a famous painter. She has a protege who lives with her named Keiko and Keiko is, she's studying art under Otoko's guidance and she's quite protective of Otoko, this woman who never got married. So when Oki goes to Kyoto to meet her, uh, she arranges it so that they don't have any time privately to, to discuss things that happened in the past. She makes sure that Keiko is there as well as these two geisha attendants to serve their meal and to play the that horrible sounding Japanese guitar so that he doesn't get any private time to discuss what happened 20 years ago. And he has to go back to Tokyo to his wife and children. We then discover that Oki is a writer and his most famous novel is about this affair that he had with her. So Oki's most famous novel is called A Girl of Sixteen. This novel created quite a scandal because it was about him having an affair with this teenager while he was married and he, had a, he has a son and he has a daughter. As well, this affair that he had with Otoko drove her a little mad. She tried to commit suicide and she had to go to the asylum for a while to, to be under observation and to try to you know, become more balanced. Because Otoko is becoming a famous painter, she is recognized as the basis for that A Girl of Sixteen novel. So people know this about her. They know that she was the woman from the book. It's not as though this affair was secret from anyone, including Oki's wife, who we will later discover, I'm not giving too much away, his wife was uh, like a typist, a secretary. She used to type all of his manuscripts and he wrote this novel about the affair he had and he was wondering, oh, should I give it to my wife? It's gonna look very suspicious if she doesn't type it for me, but if I do give it to her, she's gonna know everything that happened. So in this very short 150 page novel, quite a lot is going on between the relationship between, you know, primarily Oki in Tokyo and Otoko in Kyoto. And on Oki's side, we have his wife, what's her name, Fumiko. And on Otoko's side, we have her protege, Keiko, the relationships between these four people. This is not giving too much away because it's on the back of the book. Keiko decides that she's going to get revenge on Oki, not only for what he did to her, but also for writing the book, publishing and making money and becoming famous based on his very shameful treatment of this young girl. Keiko vows revenge. I am a huge fan of Japanese literature. I, I think I've read more Japanese literature. In translation, Japanese would be my number one category. Oh, probably Russian. Rush, I, I used to read a lot of Russian novels when I was young and clever. Do you think you're clever? We are absolutely spoiled for Japanese literature. I don't know what it is. Like maybe they have some particularly good translators. I was trying to think about how much German literature I've read. Spanish literature, very, very little. South American literature, there is a vast wealth of it, but I think I've only just scratched the surface. Perhaps a lot of people don't 
like to read books that have been translated because maybe they're, they feel very foreign or they feel hard to identify with. If you are not completely comfortable with names like Oki and Otoko and Fumiko and Keiko, if, if those names seem peculiar to you, well, you get used to it. I mean, it's like, it's like reading a Russian novel when, you know, Sergei and Mikhail and Vladimir and Igor. You read a French novel and it's Pierre and Philippe and Louis. So if, if you are looking for a place to get started with Japanese literature, I, I would really recommend this one because it's very short, it's very easy to read, and it has some of that Japanese weirdness. This married man having an affair with this very young girl. I mean, that's pretty filthy. Please uh, give it a try. I, I'm, I'm really happy I read this one because, as I said, The Sound of the Mountain was not my favorite novel. Like, I'm glad that I got this Kawabata to, to understand why he won the Nobel Prize in 1968. Uh, Yasunari Kawabata, born near Osaka in 1899, was orphaned at the age of two. My. As a boy, he hoped to become a painter, and inspiration still reflected in his novels, but his first stories were published while he was still in high school. God damn it. And he decided to become a writer. He graduated from Tokyo Imperial University in 1924, and a year later made his first impact on Japanese letters with Izu Dancer. If you're a fan of Yukio Mishima, I believe Kawabata was an inspiration to him and that they had a bit of a, a respect for one another. I believe there's a story about how Mishima was jealous of Kawabata's winning the Nobel Prize in 19. 68 and how he would have liked to have won it but at the same time because Kawabata was older and more well regarded at that point that he felt that yes it was it was correct that Kawabata received the Nobel Prize rather than him but I feel that there was a bit of uh, jealousy on Mishima's side for not having got it. When did Mishima die? Sometime around there. If you're curious about Japanese literature and you don't know where to get started strongly recommend this one. 150 pages. I read it one day. That was the first book from my big birthday book haul. How many books did I get for my birthday? I got eight. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, really just quick read, the characterization and, and the, the dilemma of these characters and their history together. Keiko deciding she wants to get revenge. I mean, it, it's like this little magical package. If you're watching this, I'm probably already in Ontario visiting my family. I'll do my best to get the video made in the next couple of days and then I'll, I'll have it on YouTube to do all the video editing. I need to use the other computer, so I have to do that here. I have to do it now, today, and I have my final exam on Tuesday. Support the channel by liking the video, leaving a comment, sharing it with your friends. If you want to give a little money, there's my Patreon page down there in the links below. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you're having a nice summer. Grant loves books.